Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this month's stay at home lecture. I'm Tim Nutt, director of the UAMS Historical Research Center, uh, located in the UAMS library on the campus of the uh, Medical Center here in Little Rock. Uh, glad to have you with us tonight. Um, hope everyone is doing well. Uh, we have a great speaker tonight, and I'm glad that you are all able to join in uh, with us tonight and um, uh, tune in for his presentation. Uh, before we get started, just want to tell you a little bit about the UAMS Historical Research Center. We are the archives division of, uh, of the UAMS library. We are in charge of uh, preserving the institutional records of UAMS, but also a second mission of ours is to preserve the history of the of the medical and other health sciences history of Arkansas. So we have, we're the only archives in the state that's dedicated to preserving the, the uh, health sciences history of Arkansas. And by do, in doing that, we collect all types of materials and artifacts, including photographs, letters, um, newspaper clippings, uh, and also artifacts such as medical instruments and um, things like that, that sort of, that tell the history of the, of the state through its medical um, history. Uh, I invite you to come and visit us. We, as I mentioned, we are located uh, in the UAMS library. We're in the Educational Two building on the UAMS campus in Little Rock. We'd love to give you a tour of the facility sometimes. Um, we have our contact information on the screen there, hrc at uams.edu is our email, and you'll also see our, our phone number there as well. So I hope you will uh, give us a call if you'd like to have a tour, or perhaps you might have some materials that you would like to donate to the collection. We're always looking for uh, materials to enhance our collections. The Stay at Home Lecture Series is sponsored by the Society for the History of Medicine and Health Professions, which is the support organization for the UAMS Histor uh, Historical Research Center. And the society helps us in a number of ways. In addition to the programming, like the Stay at Home Lecture Series, they also provide some underwriting uh, financial support for the purchase of materials for our collections, for our History of Medicine book collection, and for other and for archival materials that we come across. So we're very uh, uh, happy and appreciative of the society for their continued support of our mission. We, I encourage you to join the society. You don't have to be a member, of course, to to watch these lecture series, this lecture series. But if you are interested in the history of medicine, uh, I encourage you to join. The dues are very inexpensive for students; are five dollars. If you're if you're and you don't have to be a student at an Arkansas university or even at the at UAMS, or even at a university itself, you can also be a high school student if you're interested in medical history. So anywhere over around the country or world, if you're interested in medical history in Arkansas, I would encourage you to join the society. It's $15 for an individual membership, and then it just it graduates to a little bit higher levels uh, with higher membership fees, but all reasonable. The link, to the membership page or the society is shown on your screen. If you'd like to just bypass all that, you can just um, um, uh, just go to paypal.me slash shmhp and that will take you directly to our dues section and you can just choose which uh, membership level you'd like to join at. This, the stay at home lecture series, we started this back in the early days of the pandemic in 2020, and we're still uh, chugging along with it. It is held uh, first Thursday of every month from 7 to 8 p.m. And um, our, next our next one will be on June 1st. And uh, we'll, be, we'll have Joshua Youngblood, who's the outreach librarian at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville Special Collections. And he'll be talking about Dr. Frederick Lee Liebold, who is a renowned orthopedic surgeon. And uh, so I hope you'll join us next month uh, to hear a little bit about Dr. Liebold. The, uh, the link to join next month in any 
stay-at-home lectures after that will be the same one that you use tonight and it's shown there on your screen. We also send out a, an email reminder about the lecture series and any other programming that the society puts on. So if you'd like to, to be placed on that mailing list, uh, just send me an email at that hrc at uams.edu email and um, I'll put, make sure that you're on the distribution list for that. But the, the link to join uh, next month's stay-at-home lecture and any one after that is shown on your screen, but you'll also receive it in the email um, if you're signed up for that. Tonight, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Dr. Frank W. Brown uh, as our, as our pr uh, presenter tonight. He is, and uh, Dr. Brown is an Emory, Timory, Emory University tenured associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, and has been on the Emory faculty for over 33 years. He is the chief medical officer and chief quality officer for Emory Decatur Hospital, Emory Hillendale Hospital, and the Emory Long-Term Acute Care Hospital. He is a native of White County, Arkansas, near Searcy. And uh, he's a graduate, he attended um, and graduated from Harding College in Searcy, and he, he received his medical degree from the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. And he is also the author of Guardian of the Memories, Searcy, which uh, I believe his talk is based on tonight. And this book is still available. You can purchase it from Amazon. So I would encourage you to um, look it up if you're interested and purchase a copy. So I am going to... Um, Welcome, Dr. Brown, to the pre to the lecture tonight, and I'm going to turn off my video and audio and turn it over to you, Dr. Brown. Thank you, and let me start screen sharing. Okay, everyone should be able to see my screen now. It's a pleasure being here this evening, and I've been uh, really looking forward to this. Uh, a lot of it has been uh, the opportunity uh, to put together the slides. I'm going to keep the, the slides in this uh, presentation mode so that if I need to go back and forth, I can do so very quickly. What I'm going to talk about uh, this evening for the next 30, 40 minutes is really medical career influencers that really uh, helped uh, uh, solidify my interest in medicine. And it really relates to the Arkansas years, especially that first 20 years. And uh, the four bullet points or primary bullet points that I have here uh, is really going to kind of try to capture that. I have one slide really comparing what I do, what the last 20, 30 years have been compared to that first 20 years in Arkansas. Then I want to talk a little bit about the Cherokee influence being uh, a Cherokee citizen and my parents' impact, uh, especially with our growing up uh, uh, or, or spending a lot of time. Uh, on Little Red River and White River. And then growing up in White County, and some of the very significant environmental influencers uh, living out in the rural White County. And then something you may not have ever had anyone talk about, uh, really, about the Titan II missile bases. Uh, I lived uh, right in the, uh, uh, where a lot of those missiles were, and they did have an impact. Uh, talk a little bit about UMS and then some about the Army National Guard. Um, so to start off with, uh, I'll spend a little bit more time on this slide than on many of the others. Uh, I have several slides, um, and a lot of them are going to be pictures today. Uh, this material on the left, I'm not going to go over that. If you want to read that, that's fine. It kind of uh, zeroes in uh, on a part of what I do now and then part of my academic medical history. But what I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about, because it really establishes uh, who I am and how I became a physician uh, in the influences that Arkansas has had in my life. And I suspect to some degree, it's still very applicable to others in uh, rural parts of Arkansas. So this is really looking at that first 20 years. And, and I started off with that, I didn't learn my ABCs until the fifth grade. And part of that uh, was the, I would say, lack of educational influence in the home environment. Uh, father couldn't read. Uh, my mother got her GED in her early to mid 30s. Uh, and that was very impactful. Um, and, and part of it was uh, that my father knew what he was missing by not having an education. 
And he didn't know about uh, what people did when they went to college or after college, but he understood what his life had been without the education, and he wanted his children to have that. And that was one of the major influencers there, that and also with mother uh, not having uh, uh, much of an educational background. And as far as in the home, we had a Bible and there may have been a few other books, Sears and Robot, a robot uh, Catalog, for example, but there was not a lot of other reading material there. Uh, so early, early on, very, very much struggle uh, with learning ABCs, learning and, and, and really being an ideal um, uh, uh, student in grade school. Another pivotal point was when I was 12, uh, I ended up getting shot with a shotgun. Uh, I had about 35, 36 impact wounds in my legs. And for about six months, I was, I was kind of laid up. Uh, didn't, I wasn't able to do a lot of uh, activities uh, uh, post-gunshot wound. And part of the driver on that uh, was my uncle had been drinking. And so he got my older brother and I set up in a crossfire. And ever since then, I've had, I wouldn't necessarily say it's an aversion to alcohol, but I have a deep respect about uh, moderation and uh, for people that may use too much alcohol. The gunshot did give me uh, um, some interest in medicine, but a lot of that was because I had to see a family medicine doctor in Searcy uh, every now and then when I had edema, the swelling on uh, my left knee. And there was one time in particular uh, that that uh, physician put the needle through my patellar tendon. And that hurt. And even at that age, given that I was a hunter and uh, I spent a lot of time skinning game, I knew what tendons were. And uh, it was very clear to me that, you know, that was not the best thing to do. And that was probably that first spark or one of the first sparks beside my grandmother, that really had me kind of interested in that, you know, I probably could do better than that. I, I, I think that I, I can understand perhaps that what that individual had done, that might not have been the best thing. Uh, I note here as the third or the fourth book that before and after school, uh, really involved in a, a lot of outdoorsy things. We were hunting, trapping, doing things really to, uh, to further our food. Our, our garden, which was about an acre, was where we were able to can and we, we had our vegetables. And then most of our meat came from the river, Little Red River or White River. And we made our own uh, gill nets, hoop nets, and I'll show you a hoop net a little bit later, made our own snag lines. And I spent a lot of my adolescence with my father on the river, uh, Little Red River and White River uh, fishing. Uh, there was never time to do things before school or after school as far as ex extracurricular activities. So this was where my education was. And even though I may not have learned ABCs, may not have been a very good academic student, probably did excel in a lot of these other activities. One of the biggest pivotal points in, in my life, and I think that was probably instrumental in my career trajectory, was in the ninth grade that uh, the uh, teachers sent me home with a request for my parents uh, for me to go into special ed. Well, obviously my father couldn't read, my mother could read, so I, I had a lot of influence. I probably read it as well or better at that time than my mother. And so this was an opportunity that basically I begged them not to give permission for me to go into special ed. And this was that turning point, because if I had gone into special ed at that time, the trajectory that I had later in high school and then in college, I'm confident that would never have materialized. And again, I think that shows a, a deep contrast, and perhaps even to some degree today, in some of the individuals out in our rural areas, that all the different influences they have really determines their tra tra trajectory. And for us to be able to make uh, opportunities for them, I think I was one of those cases that uh, people saw something there and allowed me or, or had that the decision opportunity there. Well, of course, I did not uh, uh, go into special ed, later graduated from high school, 
And during the, the, those later years of high school and uh, for the first two years of college, the, the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma had a, a new constitution in 76. And I was aware of that, uh, even though in kind of that remote part of White County. So I began the process to get Cherokee citizenship. And I was the first one in our family to do that, eventually got that. It just took a lot of effort to be able to trace back to the Dow's Road. I did attend Harding College, mainly because I uh, couldn't afford another college, uh, didn't really have a lot of money to do that. I was, my father worked at Matthews and Searcy uh, in kind of a, a low-end job, but it was a, I was able to get a scholarship there that paid for, to me, a significant part of the, the college tuition, and then working several jobs, Yarnell's Ice Cream, uh, um, uh, Matthews at one point, Land of Frost, uh, worked at a ranch. So there were a lot of different things there that really kind of helped to be able to uh, attend that college. And then the other influences in those first 20 years, uh, I did meet my wife and I got married in my third year at Hardin, found that I had that special love for science and, uh, and uh, the science of math. And then the other thing, and I, I'm really not going into today, uh, 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 I think in that book, there may be a little bit of this, but, but I did spend a lot of time at Pine Canyon Ranch with uh, Dr. Hawkins, who had been a very prominent surgeon in Searcy. And there was, uh, again, some additional introduction to the medical world. But, but uh, the other thing with uh, Hawkins is that his son at this time was with the uh, CIA. He was the uh, station chief in Columbia, South America. So there was that contact. Up in Rosebud, which was just west of uh, where this ranch was, uh, Nick Bacon, um, who had uh, been a, an awardee of Congressional Medal of Honor that got that in 69, uh, uh, born in Arkansas and then uh, spent his uh, later years in Rosebud. So there were a lot of individuals that uh, from White County that had made, I would say, significant contributions, uh, especially around kind of that, that military and that really kind of influenced not only with what I was doing as far as a work ethic from my parents, but also uh, understanding and being exposed to a lot of these other individuals. So let me talk just a little bit about the, this Cherokee influence and uh, the parents' impact. Uh, I mentioned about uh, the Cherokee citizenship and uh, went ahead and uh, again, I pursued that in the, those mid to late uh, 70s, uh, 76, 78 timeframe. And while there's, I think, a little over 400,000 Cherokee citizens now, I was really in that early group uh, during that period of time when being identified as Native American uh, was not uh, in vogue. Uh, so I have one of these uh, very early numbers. And part of that, I guess, that interest in being willing to do that early on, even though it might have not have been that kind of the, the culture, the accepted culture at the time, was my maternal grandmother. Uh, and, uh, and I'm gonna show some pictures in a few minutes of their houseboat where, where my mother uh, and uncle grew up and uh, spent a lot of the early life. But, but this was a woman that also uh, did a lot with Cherokee herbal medicine uh, and, and uh, both uh, the herbs and the barks and things like that. Um, family, uh, going back from her side, the uh, Lila Goin Snake and uh, Rabbit side, uh, actually have a kinsman that was named Peter Rabbit. So this uh, is a special picture. It's uh, one of the few pictures of the, of the boat that, or the houseboat that uh, my mother grew up on uh, with primarily her mother and her brother. All this land here is fields that are flooded uh, Little Red River is actually the area behind his houseboat. And you see there's a 55 gallon drum that's used for flotation. And they would find uh, 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 drums that were floating down the river, grab them, and that would be used for flotation. There would be logs that would keep the houseboat up. So this, this was a, 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 a very remote area uh, where uh, Little Red River empties into White River. And White River would be off to the right here, about 100, 120 yards. Uh, there was many years they did not have any electricity. Uh, as far as I know, there was never any indoor plumbing there. 
uh, and the drinking water was basically what was in the river. This is another picture uh, in the summer where the Little Red River is down and you see the difference there in the bank. But you can get an idea of the logs that have been up uh, uh, grabbing whatever was uh, uh, floating down the river that could be utilized uh, for this old houseboat. And this was my mother and uncle. Uh, and this is a goat. Uh, they grew goats, uh, uh, I think some ducks, uh, uh, pigs, uh, hogs and such. Uh, but as far as being able to uh, have other, say, extracurricular school activities, they were not. It was all really related to this area. Uh, fishing was a, a major thing that my uh, parents and my grandparents did. And it was something that as I grew up, especially in my, uh, I guess, um, around seven to 10, and then especially adolescent years, spent a lot of time on the river. Uh, and it was a major influence uh, for us, uh, really being able to uh, learn a lot of different skills, learning to work together. And the other thing that was occurring during this period, and this would have been in the 50s, uh, or actually uh, probably very early 50s, was that uh, this remote area was a very prime fishing area. And so people would come from different states to uh, sometimes build a, a remote cabin in this area. And uh, this little girl's uh, parents actually uh, uh, stayed friends with my family for many years. And a lot of the clothes that we ended up getting came from that family. Uh, the the uh, clothes that my parents wore, they were either uh, given by uh, these visitors or some of you may uh, be aware that uh, flower they used to come in uh, uh, printed bags that you could take those bags and go ahead and uh, make clothes from. I remember uh, this little girl's uh, parents had uh, brought me uh, suits. Um, uh, I remember one, a shark skin suit uh, back in when I was probably 15, 16. I had no use for wearing a suit. I had never worn a suit as far as I was aware, but I did wear those and I wore them hunting because they were warm. And during the winter, uh, I would be seen going in the woods and I had this really beautiful kind of brownish shark skins uh, suit. One of the things I already mentioned about the, the pursuit of education and how my parents really uh, valued education and wanted the children and, and myself to, to get educated, uh, they, they struggled uh, to get to school uh, and I'll show you part of an article or, or an article from Arkansas Democrat here in just a moment. Um, this is White River uh, during winter months uh, and uh, water levels up. That's very uh, strong currents. And early on, they would go down about 12 miles from where their houseboat was to Georgetown. And they would take these back trails and stay in off the main river and this was how they, they, they got to uh, uh, school. Uh, and again, uh, doing this at a very young age. In the uh, probably mid 1950s, there, uh, a reporter for the Arkansas Democrat uh, had a journey down uh, uh, there to uh, really get their story. And I, I have some clips of, of this. I just wanted to uh, highlight because I think it uh, gives uh, uh, again, uh, some information about that's very dear to me and that has always influenced me both for the pursuit of education, but also from the standpoint of a work ethic. So, so they did live most of their life uh, and, and my uh, mother and uncle pretty much up through the first, say, 18 years of their life were pretty much on this houseboat and, and may have had uh, some renovations from different wood uh, floating down the, the river and all. Um, but they would, uh, in their adolescent years, uh, when they were going to high school in Augusta, they would actually end up going about three miles by boat uh, down a Little Red and White River to a place called Princeton Landing. And all that uh, means is that instead of having the high banks, there was this land in this area where it was fairly, uh, where well, it was not a high bank and it was an area you could pull a boat up. It may have been an area at one time that had a stream or a brook that had run through there and carved down those uh, high banks. 
but that's where they would put that uh, boat. Then they would walk about two miles at that time were cotton fields and then uh, catch a bus ride 14 miles up to Augusta. And so they would do that uh, twice a day. Uh, and then in the winter, when sometimes it was really difficult or the uh, weather not permitting, they would find a place to stay in Augusta for several days until they could get back. During the early years there, when they were uh, going down, uh, when they first started in that six, seven year age group, uh, I mentioned about going down uh, 12 miles to, by river to Georgetown. Uh, their father uh, took them the, the first year. But then after that, you had a six and seven year old making that trip 12 miles down uh, to Georgetown. And especially, during the winter months and spring when the water was high, uh, it was very difficult to, uh, for your landmarks. And so he had, uh, he was a, a smoker and he had uh, put these Prince Albert cans and nailed them to trees. And that was the path that uh, uh, my mother and uncle took uh, to get to school and then to get back. Again, that pursuit of education, uh, her parents wanted them to learn. And uh, part of that driving was the, to the, 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 I guess, the unspoken message that, you know, our lives are such that they are, that education could give you the opportunity to do something different. And so th that, uh, their parents uh, were very uh, impactful uh, for trying to get them there. Uh, but again, they were young and they were doing this on their own. Uh, I didn't have opportunities to participate in but rare uh, school activities. My grandfather had a military history. Don't know much about that. Uh, and uh, he had a lot of poor health. Some of it may have been due to that. I think that he probably had tuberculosis or adenocarcinoma of the lung at, at one point. Uh, but, but regardless, there was the, the tradition there of uh, some military. I mentioned earlier about my grandmother and some of the Indian remedies um, uh, used especially to herbs. I never really had a, a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one with that. Uh, I was just very aware of it. I know we were dosed. I know my parents were, were dosed uh, as time went on and nothing adverse occurred to that. They eventually got electricity uh, to that uh, little houseboat there, on Little Red River. Uh, and I mentioned here also about uh, some of the shooting skills, uh, again, uh, trying to survive out there, uh, shooting squirrels or rabbits and, and then uh, being a, a fisherman. Uh, another picture, Little Red River and the top of that boat. Uh, this is one of those hoop nets, uh, the same hoop nets that I worked with and I built when uh, I was an adolescent and doing some of the exact same things that uh, they did, both on um, this area, the Little Red River, and over to the right, White River, same areas they fished when uh, they were in uh, this age and, and older in the same areas that my grandfather had done. Uh, my, my uncle, the one I was with when I got shot, uh, fish, uh, uh, one of the reasons people would want to come to this area uh, was that uh, there are not many people fish there. It looks like there are five very large uh, flathead catfish. Uh, I'll show you one that I had uh, a little later, 38 pound. But these right here are huge. These are probably, some of these are 65 to probably mid 70 pound uh, catfish. So um, very, very big and a lot of food here and a lot of food uh, or fish that could be sowed to, to others. One of the big things that uh, happened uh, was when electricity uh, did come from Arkansas Power and Light, uh, putting electricity in these fishing camps. And that's actually where my uh, mother actually met my father because he was a lineman working with uh, Arkansas APNL. Again, another look at the houseboat at a different period of time when my mother was 17 or 18. Uh, call attention again, those 55 gallon drums uh, partially submerged, and then the logs. And uh, the other thing is, once you're outside that uh, 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 houseboat, on the end, you have a, a little bit of uh, dock open area where the boats are tied. But if you're walking along the sides, 
you know, that's not the easiest place to walk. Uh, so, uh, again, a fairly cramped environment, a very different type than perhaps many of us uh, have experienced in our lives. Uh, again, uh, uh, the, uh, the fish, uh, this is a buffalo. Again, uh, they caught lots of really large fish. And uh, all the years that I fished there, uh, especially as an adolescent, we had some pretty big fish. But of that kind of fish, I had never seen one that large before. This uh, uncle of mine was also military. So we had my uh, mother's father that had served in World War I. Uh, my father had done military duty, but you know, he couldn't read or write. He uh, never accepted a promotion. And from an early age, we were aware of that. And we were aware that he didn't accept the promotion and because it was the lack of the education. Another driver for us to, and really kind of that responsibility that, hey, we have the opportunity to learn, we need to really do so and try to excel. And uh, again, uh, this uncle uh, here, I put down the NAACP, so the, the National Association uh, for Advancement of Colored People. My uncle was a uh, card care and member. And he couldn't uh, early, especially when he started working for the Arkansas Fire and Light, the uh, group of people that were his peers were Blacks. Uh, he was accepted uh, with them. Uh, and so they accepted him and he began to uh, be uh, uh, going to meetings with them and, and doing a lot of things that they did, which was very different than the dominant Black culture at that time. So going to uh, growing up in White County and looking at some of the environmental influences, let me talk a little bit about uh, where when we lived out in uh, northwest of Searcy. Uh, this is a picture from the mid 90s. But growing up, we had an outhouse that was probably 50 feet behind the, the house. So even in the winter uh, with ice or rain, uh, you know, we've had to make a, a quick dash outside. We had a well out in the back of the house, an artesian well uh, that we would have to go draw water. Uh, if you're going to do your clothes or do dishes, you had to go outside and draw the water and bring it in. But, uh, there was no telephone until my first year of college. And I still lived at home until I moved out my third year of college when I got married. The one thing we did have, we did have electricity. When we moved in to this house, we had this is the first house my family ever owned. Prior to that, we would uh, um, uh, rent places and move from one location to another. With this location, uh, we had the outside walls, but there was no interior walls. Uh, it was just two by fours. And then eventually, after several months, my father was able to get some butcher paper and put up paper walls. Uh, there was no inside insulation. There was actually no insulation on these outside walls either. Uh, so in very uh, cold in the winter, because we did have that one stove, but, but no insulation. Um, one of the other things, we finally got indoor plumbing, but we had to go ahead and build our own sewer lines. But again, using those 55-gallon drums that you can find that uh, people had used and no longer needed. I'd already mentioned a little bit about uh, some of that medical exposure from the gunshot and that knee tap. And the other thing was uh, from injured animals. And I um, remember having a dog when I was about 15 that got hit by a car. And I did not want to put that animal down. And I remembered uh, uh, very vividly that I uh, took the dog and straightened its leg and uh, splinted it and took care of that dog for about four to six weeks uh, before taking that splint off. And the dog did well. Uh, so there, there were, during this period of time, there were opportunities uh, to be able, you know, understanding that, hey, some of this medical stuff, you know, may be very useful and it's consistent with my parents' education. They, had, they knew about going to doctors, but they didn't know about different types of doctors or much about what doctors did other than take care of, of you when you were injured. One of the other things that happened was in the early 90s, I mentioned about the outhouse. Well, with outhouse and outside well, 
the potential for ground uh, water contamination is pretty high. Um, we, we read about that some uh, even now occurring, but it's normally from chemical spills. Uh, there was a water testing done that uh, parents had had completed and it showed E. coli. Problem was they didn't know what that meant. And the water department or the health department, when they sent the results, didn't follow up. So nothing was done for probably one year, maybe two years. Um, nephew, uh, who also lived here, uh, was uh, very ill. And he was probably six or seven years old at that time. Uh, when I found out about it and made the connection that this was uh, groundwater contamination, I went in and funded a water line from the county. It was a few miles away and got water uh, water brought into this house for them and also for some of the neighbors at that time. And this was uh, what I would end up going out there as an adolescent to draw water. Uh, not a fond memory. Uh, I did a lot of the things that my parents had done as far as uh, gardening and as far as living or working on the river, uh, fishing and all. This was a 38 pound uh, flathead catfish. A um, lot smaller than the ones that shown earlier. But uh, I was on a trajectory, especially from uh, say up until maybe age uh, 15, uh, probably being very similar to what my uncle, my, my father, their lifestyle had been. Uh, but a lot of that ended up changing in that ninth grade when it did not go into special ed. Uh, built a lot of snag lines. Uh, this was something that the game wardens did not like. The, the, the uh, line, the, the drops were so close together, they tended to be very dangerous. Uh, but, but it was very effective for us being able to catch uh, fish. Uh, some of the hoot nets, this, this is a, a hurtful picture for me because these were all hoop nets that I had built. And in the 2000s, I'd taken a picture of uh, they had been discarded out behind the house. Uh, but again, a lot of memories there of uh, a lot of evenings during the winter, uh, sewing all these and then putting them together. So talk a little bit about uh, the Titan II missiles. Uh, and in a moment, I'll show you a picture of where they were located. But the first one that was installed was near Searcy. Uh, and it, at that time, uh, uh, my parents and I or our family lived about three miles away. Uh, and again, we, we rented and we moved around some, but we were always around these. And even growing up and as an adolescent, we knew at any given time where probably uh, six or seven of these missiles were, uh, we would see the uh, Air Force convoys uh, go in uh, to uh, relieve the individuals. There were 18 of these in Arkansas, and, that, and they called it uh, a Titan field, and I'll show you why. Uh, 18 in Kansas, and there were 17 in Arizona. And this was so impactful when I had an opportunity to visit Tucson many years ago, went uh, southwest of Tucson uh, to visit one of the uh, Titan II museums. The, this one that was near Searcy in 65, uh, actually had an explosion, and there were quite a few individuals, the workers there, that were killed. Uh, this was a big event uh, uh, for all of us, and again, even at a young age, we, we knew that something bad had happened, and uh, we were only about four or five miles from there. Uh, the, the first month that I was at uh, UAMS in medical school, had another one of these missile complexes uh, explode from the liquid fuel. Um, and, and on this one, uh, the, the safeties, uh, uh, this, uh, the uh, bunker blast door at the top was actually blown off. And I don't remember how many tons that thing weighed, but, but it was blown uh, a, a good distance away. This actually had a nine megaton uh, warhead on it, and the safeties held. But this was a significant weapon, and I put here just, you know, the impact to the the locations, uh, it would have messed up Conway for sure. Uh, and this was also one of those kind of fears at that time that, you know, something bad would always happen and, and, and you, you had that awareness. This is a, a picture of one from uh, uh, to, uh, uh, southwest of Tucson, but it's the same, uh, same kind of missile, uh, the same uh, uh, Titan II. I still have this uh, picture here 
Uh, I have it on my uh, uh, bookshelf in my office at Emory. And uh, this shows uh, the star here is where we live. This was the first one that had uh, the 53 people that died when the explosion occurred in 1965. And then the one in 1980 when it started at UAMS, this is the one that uh, had the liquid fuel explosion and then threw the warhead uh, outside of the complex. Uh, and you can see there's a row of uh, missiles and then another row of missiles and then a third row of missiles. And that's, that's why it's called a Titan field. And when I, I grew up, we moved in houses in, in this little circle right in there. And, and we knew about this one, this one, one in Judsonia, and this one here, and this one over here. Uh, and, uh, you know, occasionally we'd be going by them and we would see uh, the Air Force uh, personnel going in and out. It, it does make an impact. And, and in fact, when I was uh, a commander of the 404th uh, Medical Detachment in North Little Rock, uh, one of the things I had in my safe was uh, if there was a nuclear assault on the United States, where would we regroup? Well, obviously, this part of Arkansas, you don't go that way. Our regrouping zone, here's Little Rock area here. Uh, our regrouping area was way down here in uh, the Ouachita National Forest. So talk a little bit about UAMS, and uh, I'll finish up here very quickly. Uh, current uh, UAMS, or, or pretty current, but uh, when uh, I was there, uh, Jeff Banks was there. Uh, this old nursing home was there. It was actually the educational building, and I think where the library is now was located there in a psychiatry building. But my wife and I lived on that 10th floor in that southeast corner. So every morning we would have the sunshine and greet us, look in, they had a beautiful view of the Capitol. And then when they were building the VA, uh, 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 we were there uh, during that period of time, and uh, when all the dignitaries came in, uh, we were we had a, a very special view of those. And while at UAMS, one of the things that I had done that the, uh, the chancellor was very gracious to do was we established an association of Native American medical students there. And then the other thing is that my wife and I, while we did have uh, um, uh, working some odd jobs and things, and I actually had a educational uh, grant due to uh, being a Native American. We still had need for some additional funds, and so we both uh, were in the Army National Guard. And one of the things that may not be aware of, or, 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 or Tim Nutt probably is, probably is that um, at that time, and I suspect now, there are quite a few uh, UAMS medical students that were uh, at the 148th EVAC hospital uh, up in uh, uh, Camp Robinson, uh, the old Fort uh, Pike. And in the mid-1980s, uh, it, it was this group, the 148th, that ended up being the, uh, um, uh, the I guess, the cornerstone for the national advertisement for uh, National Guard. And so during that time, uh, several of the, uh, the UAMS medical students were uh, pictured in that. And I don't remember what those medical students' names. I remember I was uh, also in that brochure. Um, and uh, even there I am. Uh, I'm definitely not a surgeon now. Uh, uh, never had been, actually. Uh, but the Army wanted me to be a, a thoracic surgeon. And that was the push there. My wife, uh, had been, her uh, MOS was as an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, but she always wanted to be uh, an obst obstetrician there ever since she was knee high to a grasshopper. I, I was much more uh, flexible as time went on. And when I got a, a command and had that opportunity, uh, I, I knew that with both of us being uh, surgeons, that would not work out well. And so I narrowed down uh, my uh, career decision to neurology, psychiatry, or internal medicine. And eventually chose on psychiatry, mainly because of a quality of life issue that I would have the most flexibility and I could still do as much neurology and probably uh, medicine as I wanted to. I uh, had an opportunity while at uh, UAMS to go to Panama, to be deployed to, to the, uh, Panama on two different occasions. Uh, and uh, that was before uh, US uh, went into 
uh, Panama in 89. Uh, I think this is probably a picture from around 87. And also my, my wife had an opportunity to be there also. And while in Panama, we even had uh, opportunities uh, uh, while we were stationed at a, an airborne base to uh, do repellent and things like that. And so that's uh, a lot, some of the information from those uh, UAMS years. Um, Tim had mentioned a book that I'd done uh, years ago, and this book was written mainly because I had a donor that kept asking me to put a lot of my stories, a lot of my history uh, down. And you can see that that houseboat uh, is prominent on the front of that. And then the other reason finally did it was just to really be able to give some memories to the children. And some of the things I've talked about, especially the first part uh, tonight, it, there's a lot of stories there that uh, expand on a lot of those things. Um, but this is really dealing with those first 20 years of, of growing up in a very rural environment in uh, north central Arkansas. And that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you. And uh, uh, kind of I'll stop sharing now if there were any comments, questions or you know, anything else there. I'd be glad to entertain that. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Brown. That was uh, interesting, an interesting look at growing up in um, in um, um, White County. I'm trying to get my video on. There I am. Um, and um, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Brown, please feel free to use the chat feature uh, and type your questions in the chat box. Um, while we're waiting on that, Dr. Brown, I'm just curious as to how what were your your parents were encourage encouraged you when you um, expressed an interest in going into medical school? I honestly don't think I ever mentioned that to them. Actually, uh, I think that was the, the decision that uh, probably my wife and I made. Uh, I think that even before I met her, that had been a strong interest there. Um, but as far as from their under again, uh, highest respect uh, for my parents and for their trajectory. But the, a lot of lim the limitations of their understanding what you do in college, uh, what college meant, uh, and uh, much less understanding about uh, medical school. Uh, and even from my, my own, uh, I had a lot of, uh, I guess, lack of understanding too. Because uh, during that period of time, uh, when applying to UAMS, had actually uh, gotten a invitation to another medical school to apply, uh, and um, I had never heard of that medical school, so I threw it in the trash. Uh, it turned out that it was Johns Hopkins, and at the time they were ranked number one in the country. Uh, never heard of them, uh, so I didn't have a whole lot of background there. Th th this was all new to me. And I relied heavily uh, on my wife on that one. Mm -hmm. We do have a question. Uh, did you ever consider pharmacy or veterinarians, veterinary sciences? Uh, the short answer is no. But again, it's not because I had anything against them or a desire to have an MD above them. It's because I didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, there was a couple of pharmacists in Searcy but I had no earthly idea how you became a pharmacist. Uh, and as far as a, a veterinarian, there at that time, there may have been one in Cersei, but I had no earthly idea what they did. Mm -hmm. So but again, um, I had a, an accelerated learning curve. Uh, and when started medical school, it was a different language. College was a different language for a lot of things. And one of the reasons I probably excelled at science and math is because it didn't it didn't matter you, know, I, you could speak that language easier so a lot of these other occupations uh, may have been you know well suited to have done but just didn't have a background and didn't have a, a knowledge base or an exposure to them hmm. I'm curious as to when you um, when you came to Little Rock to go to medical school um, I've done a presentation on the history of UAMS, and one of the things that um, that came up in my research is that there 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 was a, uh, I guess it was a bar, 
more than anything called PECs across the campus uh, from UAMS. And I'm wondering, I'm curious is if you had heard, if you heard of PECs while you were in at school at UAMS and what were your, if you had and you did visit PECs, what was your, your, what was it like? I'm, I'm just kind of curious. So, uh, I, I remember at PECs, uh, I have no recollection and I, I'm sure I never entered there. Mm -hmm. uh, you also had to remember too that uh, it wasn't an aversion to alcohol, but uh, I was very careful uh, about alcohol. Uh, and again, part of that had to deal with my uncle, but also my father was an alcoholic. And I, I saw what that did. And so uh, I do go to bars now, but I go there mainly because of the food that some of those bars and grills are very good, but, but it's not because of alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there was a text that, you know, as knowing anything about it, I, I really don't know. Uh, there were some other restaurants uh, around there that we were very fond of. And uh, what was the, what was when you were at, we, what was, let me uh, ask you a question. Another question came in. Where were you fishing? What other types of fish were there? Were there crappie or bass? So the, the areas that uh, we use, um, you got sports fishing, you got commercial fishing. A lot of what we were doing would be classified as commercial fishing because we had to have commercial license because we were using snag lines, uh, hoop nets, skill nets, things like that that we made. Um, and, and for that, we were primarily after catfish and buffalo uh, as the two things. Uh, and a lot of that was because we needed to get that and have food and uh, get it into our freezer. Uh, but we did have opportunities for fun times uh, and uh, would do sports fishing. And uh, in that area, uh, there's a, a, now it's a hurricane li uh, a wildlife refuge. Uh, it's much more developed now. It's very difficult to get into when I was growing up. Uh, but there were a lot of small lakes there. And there would be uh, crappie, uh, there would be bass, uh, um, there would be a lot of brim, goggle eye, uh, and uh, we would do that. Uh, and that, and that was kind of special because it was a different kind of fish. And then out in the country where I lived, there were some uh, ponds that we would occasionally get permission. I think I remember one time I probably did not did not get permission, uh, but that we would fish those for uh, especially largemouth bass. Any other questions? We do have another question. Over your career, how, how did libraries figure into your story? Okay, that's a, actually a very interesting and perceptive question. Um, so during um, early life, um, I'm, I probably never graced a library. I might not even know what a library was. But when I got into college and found that there at Hardin there was a library, uh, it, it was incredible, and uh, that was one of the primary places that I studied. And I had uh, I commuted back and forth, and at home, out in the country, there was really not a good place to study, and so I had to find places in the science building or the library. So I spent lots of times in that library. Same thing at UAMS. <clears throat> that was uh, the place to study, and it was the resource. And since I had, or at least I felt that I was learning a new language, uh, ended up spending a lot of time there. Now, granted, even in my Emory career, for the first 15 years, libraries were very important. But with that and uh, the internet, you know, I had the library at my fingertips now. So it's very different now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, another question, when you didn't go into the special education classes, did you get any pushback from the teachers and another one, did, a follow-up, did you ever get extra support from the teachers in school? And then what, what drove the change that uh, sort of fueled you to becoming valedictorian? Okay, um, you know, a lot of that's central to the ninth grade and uh, not learning the, uh, my ABCs in the fifth grade and then getting shot in the seventh grade, um, that eighth and uh, eighth grade uh, and really the seventh and eighth grade were really fast acceleration and really trying to get a lot of uh, missing uh, material and, and getting up to where probably be an average. 
that ninth grade, uh, I don't recall any pushback because my parents said no. And I don't know if anyone, they couldn't call them because they didn't have a phone. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm not aware of any pushback. I guess they decided to let me see what I could do. But the prominent thing in the ninth grade is that I had a science teacher that as I was learning fast uh, uh, during that year, he started calling me Professor Franklin. Well, my name's not Franklin, but that was fine uh, because that was kind of special. He took special interest there, not not extra education or extra time, nothing like that. It was just that in class or, 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 or even after class, whenever he saw me, how are you doing, Professor Franklin? That 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 helped. Uh, you know, that, that was a pat on the back. Um, how what were the driving changes to become valedictorian? At that time, I, I think a lot of it may have been uh, I could learn things quickly. I could memorize things. If it was science or math, it came easy. Typing, um, you know, I, I excelled at, ta at typing. Um, drama, I wasn't very good at speech and all, but um, uh, I think part of it was that there was a willingness uh, from the teachers that, you know, I was I was actually trying, and they knew didn't participate in any extracurricular activities that showed up and then left. There was a bus that brought me, and there was a bus that took me. Um, yeah, there, there's some difficulties, yes, but it wasn't difficulties about being Native American. That wasn't the biggest issue there was that you were either, either from the town or you were from the country. And if you were from the country, you were a different, you know, you were a different group of people there. And yeah, there was some conflict over that. But, but I think a lot of it was some of the positive comments from teachers that really helped some uh, young person uh really understand it. hey I, I like those positive comments and this is something that's important and uh, then the other big thing during this time is that my father could not read or write and my mother was somewhat limited and saw that every day and probably one of those pivotal uh, another pivotal point was when our one of our trips my father going to the river we'd stop to get ice and he asked the man now, how much is ice? And the man made a, a comment. Can't you read? It's right here. And pointed to the sign. That hurt my father so much. I excelled. And that was one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for uh, being here uh, with us tonight. Uh, it was such a great um, presentation. So inspiring and um, so important. So appreciative of you uh, sharing your story with us. Well, it's my pleasure, and uh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Well, thank you all uh, for being here, and we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next month on June 1st. And uh, Dr. Brown, thank you once again uh, for being here. You have, you have a good night, and we'll look forward to talking with you again sometime in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye.